everybody welcome all our virtual viewers all right so tonight we are learning Le'ilu Nishmat Rav Shmaryahu Yosef Chaim Ben Yaakov Yisrael as well as Le'ilu Nishmat Avram Ben Chaim Yehuda and Yechazkel Ben Avraham we're also learning tonight Le'ilu Fuashlema to Zechariah Shimon Ben Cyril and Namik Netaniel Ben Miriam and Liad Gittel Bas Chana Okay, so tonight, Be'ezrat Hashem, God willing, this will be the final of the series on Rav Chaim Kanievsky and the stories and the lessons that we can learn from him. Now, you know, <clears throat> the idea behind these types of classes is not just, oh, we have also Lilu Nishmat Ariel Chai Ben Eliezer and Michal Ben Yitzchak. Okay, so the reason behind these types of classes is not only to like realize the godless, the greatness of Rav Chaim Kanievsky or whatever gadol you know that you may be listening to or we may be speaking about, but rather the the main focus really is is look at what he was able to accomplish. Look at the amazing things he was able to accomplish, and what can I do to change my life? to just get a little bit closer to that greatness, or maybe to emulate the greatness of Rav Chaim, or whatever it is, or that, any other gadol. So that really is the purpose, and I was, <clears throat> you know, I was speaking to my brother-in-law, and my brother-in-law said, you know what you should do, you should ask to see from these classes how many people actually changed, how many people actually took upon themselves, and I was thinking about that, and I was like, in one sense, I was like curious, but in another sense, I'm like nervous, because what is the percentage of people and like, let's be honest with ourselves, right? What, what is the percentage of people that they hear something or they see something and that's gonna motivate them to change? Usually change takes a lot of work and it's usually done when there's like, you know, at a point of no return or it's usually done at the course of many years. But how many people, and there are, by the way, don't get me wrong, there are people, there's a select, there's a select percentage, a select few of every, you know, class that goes out, every year that goes out, that people take that to heart and actually change their, their life. And, you know, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, you know, what, where is the percentage? And then I was thinking further, like, where do I, me personally, where do I fall in this percentage? And I know over the past, you know, few weeks since, you know, Rav Chaim was, was Rav Chaim Kanevsky was Nifter, I was thinking of different things uh, and you know I, I've come across situations where I was like you know what like let me let me like I sort of like had a test and I and I choose successfully in certain area in certain times because of like okay wait if Rabhaim would be able to do XYZ like there was lessons that I took from Rabhaim and I actually utilized it in my daily day, day life but there are tests that I didn't and I just slipped and it just didn't you know I didn't have that mindset it's when I had that mindset that all of a sudden okay fine now let me overcome it so an idea that I you know may want for you know you know to share for everybody to go and think of themselves like to utilize the lessons that we learn from here for your own personal life the, the purpose of like of these classes is that you should change to become a better person. And Baruch Hashem, I have to say that, you know, like the amazing emails that I've been getting or, or you know, the people are speaking to me over the phones, how like this, these, this, you know, this entire class that we've been doing for the past few years, these Thursday night classes, you know, Baruch Hashem actually changed people's lives, which is unbelievable. It's like an amazing merit, the schut that I had to be a part of that. But when you think of it, the percentage of people, how many people, you know, you, you see something, how many times does it take an effect and you actually do something about it? And, you know, nine out of ten times, I think it's safe to say that we get inspired or we hear things amazing and it just doesn't change that much in our lives. So, to, to put that little pointer out there, to make that class a little bit more successful, to make anything, for that matter, a little bit more successful, life, and, and this we're going to touch upon it a little bit later, Bezat Hashem, life is full of opportunities. You have an opportunity to gain, you have an opportunity to lose. Let us use these lessons, these stories for an opportunity to gain, an opportunity to change our lives, to become a better person, a better spouse, a better parent, a better you know, daughter, a better son, uh, you know, a better employee, a better boss, a better Jew, you know, like a better in, in all angles. So with that introduction, <clears throat> I want to share with you a story that I really wanted to make it into the 
second class, but it couldn't, it didn't make it the cut because of the time. But this was a story that really shows the chesed of Rav Chaim Kanevsky and also the humility, the anivas of Rav Chaim Kanevsky. This is a story set over by Rabbi, Rabbi Nassen Einfeld. So this story goes back to 1997. And uh, um, in 1997, this rabbi was uh, Rav Nassen Enfeld. He he had this pain in his leg, and he says over that he gets these pains every once in a while, but they subside, they go away. It was Simchas Taira, 1997, where all of a sudden the pain came, and it was not going away, and it was getting worse and worse. And he was at the point where like dancing with the Torah and Simchas Torah was out of the question. There was like nothing to there was nothing to talk about. And not only that that he went and he asked one of his friends if they could please get him a wheelchair that they'd be able to go and wheel him out. He couldn't even walk. When he got home, the, the amount of pain was that it was forget about a suda. He went straight to bed in excruciating pain and he, he dove at Mincha in bed. He stayed in bed the entire time. <clears throat> After Yom Tov was over, he tried to find a doctor to see what was going on. Like what, what was this, this like, you know, this crazy unbearable pain. And he found a doctor that, you know, would be able to see him, but he had to go and he had to move. He was, you know, he says over the story, it was such excru- every time he, his, his foot touched the floor, it was an excruciating pain. And not only that, he went to the doctor and the doctor has to touch the foot. Every time he touched the foot, he was in complete agony. Uh, com- you know, like, like so much pain that we cannot even begin to imagine. And, you know, he, he explains it as if you, you, you take a burning hot rod of metal and every time someone touched him, that's the pain that he felt at it on his foot. Like to, to understand the level of pain that he was going for. However, this doctor, he was searching and he was searching. He couldn't find a reason, a diagnosis for the problem. So <clears throat> he went back home. He was able to fall asleep. Then the next day, he called his regular doctor, which was thankfully able to make a home visit. Came to his house, pulled pulled, pried, checked, twisted, turned, try to find a reason for this problem, nothing doing. It was in- inconclusive. He couldn't find the reason for the problem. So his doctor goes and gave him a very, very strong you know, prescription for painkillers. And he said, if this doesn't subside the pain, then you have to go to the hospital. He said it was close to Shabbos. He says, if by after Shabbos your pain is still there, you must go to the hospital. And he wrote him a prescription. I guess this is in Israel. He wrote him a prescription to be admitted to the hospital to run you know, tests in X, Y, and Z because X, you know, A, B, and C didn't work. So Shabbos came, Shabbos went, and the pain did not go away. So he went to the hospital. Most of Shabbos, he goes to the hospital. And there was all the specialists that were over there. They were going and they were trying to run all these tests and diagnosis. Finally, they came back to him and they said, listen, so this is the issue. He says, you have tumors growing in your leg and that's why you're having these problems. And they said, right now, we don't have an immediate course of treatment. For whatever reason, they couldn't give him a treatment, but they gave him even stronger painkillers to, you know, to help. At this point, he goes and he calls Rabbi Lemelech Fira. Rabbi Lemelech Fira was he's a um, an askan. He he specializes in medical referrals in Israel. He does this to you know to help people out to make the connections, the shiduch between the patient and the doctor for the big you know specialist. So he calls up this this you know Rabbi Lemelech Fira and he says, "Can you help me out? This is my situation. Who can I go to?" So he goes and he says, "You know the best in the business is somebody by the name of Professor Dekel from Ramat Gan." He says, "You got to go to him." So it's fine. He gives him the contact information. He calls up the, you know, the office and the office says, not a problem. We'll see you. We'll give you the next available appointment, which is in four weeks time. He was like, four. There's like, I can't last four weeks. I'm in excruciating pain. And you know, the secretary is like, what, what can I do? This is the next available appointment. I, you want me to push somebody out because of you? And he goes and he says, the rabbi goes and says, listen, I, I, I don't want anybody to, to lose their spot because of me, but maybe you could speak to the doctor on my behalf. And he goes on and he explains, he says, I went to the hospital and the hospital said that there is a tumor that is growing in his leg. And if he doesn't do something fast, it's just going to get more difficult, more painful and harder to operate on, harder to treat. So she says, okay, let me speak to the doctor. Hold on a second. She goes, she, she puts him on hold, comes back a few minutes later. And she says, you know, the doctor hears your concern and he's willing to see you uh, this coming Wednesday. And he's like, unbelievable. You know, I'll take it. I'll take the appointment. That Wednesday, when he's about to go to the doctor, he calls up, um, you know, his, you know, Reb Chaim Kanievsky. He calls up the, you know, the, the whoever was with Reb Chaim and he says, can you do me a favor? Can you give me a, can you get a, a bracha from Reb Chaim? This is, this is my problem. Reb Chaim, you know, they, they had a relationship. He says, this is my problem, can you get me, get me a bracha? So he goes to the doctor 
and the doctor goes and runs a bunch of tests and he says listen he says your previous diagnosis that it was a bunch of tumors was incorrect you don't have any tumors over there this is actually a problem with your spinal cord and what you would need is you would need a special epidural injection and that's going to be your treatment however at this point in time we're still waiting for all the results to come back from the you know from the test that we did come back monday and then we'll have a you know definitive a conclusive diagnosis for you so he goes over to the doctor and says, fine, you know, I, first of all, I appreciate you letting me in, but, um, you know, assuming this is the right diagnosis, what's my prognosis? Like, like how long do I have to suffer with this agonizing uh, pains? So the doctor goes and says, listen, he says, your, your pain probably will last in about six weeks. However, you will need to go physiotherapy for about a year or better yet, at least a year. So this rabbi was like, he was like shocked. He's like six weeks. He was barely able to survive. You know, this almost was, it hasn't even been in one week is barely, barely able to survive. You're telling him six weeks now, the next day, Thursday morning, <clears throat> this was a one full week from the onset of his pain. He, his wife told him that, you know, he's going shopping. She's going shopping. So he asked her, he says, do me a favor, lock the door. I don't, you know, I can't see any visitors right now. I'm in too much pain. Like, I don't want anybody to come in right now. I need to rest. So she says, fine. She takes the lock and she locks the door. A short while later, there, the doorbell rings. And, you know, he's sitting in bed and he's ignoring it. He's in too much pain to even, you know, deal with it. And, the, but the doorbell doesn't stop. It's like ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, keeps on going. <clears throat> and he keeps on ignoring it. Like 30 seconds go by and all of a sudden there's like knocking on his door and the knocking doesn't stop. She's like, what's going on over here? So he <clears throat> screams out to the door. His little apartment's a little bit small. You could actually scream from your bedroom to the door and they could hear you. And he screams out the door. He's like, he's like, who's there? So he says, this is, you know, Yeshayo Epstein, Rav Yeshayo Epstein. He was Rav Chaim Kanievsky's driver. And <clears throat> he says like, what can I do for you? He says, the Rav is downstairs in the car. He wants to come up to visit you. And he's like, what? He's like, Rav Chaim came to my house to visit me? And he jumps out of bed, starts hopping on one foot, trying to go and open the door. In Israel, at least the majority of the doors that I've encountered and the majority of the doors I know, the way that it works is that the locks, it, you, you, there's a key in the, in, the, in the outside and there's a key in the inside also. That's how, you lock the, that's how generally you lock the door. So there was a key on both sides. So the door was locked by his wife from the outside. Now he had to find his key to unlock it. But the problem was he hasn't used the key in over a week. And he's trying to fumble around, try to find the key. Rav Chaim's downstairs and he's hopping from one end of the house to the other end of the house, trying to find the key, but he couldn't figure it out. He couldn't find the key. And he's like, he goes over to the driver and says, I'm sorry. He says, I can't get the key. I don't know where the key is. I can't open the door. So he says, fine, <clears throat> I'll tell, you know, I'll tell, I'll tell the Rav that you don't have the, you know, that you're not able to open the door. <clears throat> so he goes down to, um, to Rav Chaim Kanievsky and he says, you know, there's no need for you to go upstairs. The door is locked and we can't get in. And um, he says, uh, he, he says, Rav Chaim says, what do you mean the door is locked? He says, yeah, the, you know, he can't find the key in order to, to open the door. So Rav Chaim goes to him and says, how do you know this information? And he says, no, we spoke through the door. I'm saying we weren't able to see each other, but we spoke through the door. So he says, oh, you spoke through the door? Okay, not a problem. So I'll speak also through the door. And Rav Chaim makes his way upstairs. <coughs> he gets upstairs and, um, and, and all of a sudden there's another knock on the door. So the, the rabbi was sick, was, was with pain. He's like, he's like, yes. He's like, who's there? And Rav Chaim says, the Rav is right outside. And he's like, the Rav, <coughs> he goes over to the Rav. He's like, he, you know, the Rav obviously knew that he couldn't open the door. So he goes over to him and he starts, you know, like saying, says, Rabbi, he starts crying bitterly. He says, I'm suffering in terrible pain. So Rav Chaim calls out to him. He says, he says, Rav Nassan, Rafua Shalema, Rafua Shalema. And he goes on and he says, HaKadosh Baruch should send you a swift and quick Rafua Shalema. Rav Chaim started descending, you know, going down the stairs and the, the rabbi calls him out again and he says, Rabbi, please, the pain is overwhelming. I can't handle it. So Rav Chaim called out again. He should have a speedy refuah shleima. <coughs> he, Rav Chaim went down the stairs and this man hopped over to the window to watch Rav Chaim get into the car. He watched Rav Chaim to get the car and Rav Chaim realized, you know, he figured that he's probably, and before Rav Chaim goes into the car, he looks up again and to the apartment and he sees, you know, the Rav standing over there. Rav Chaim calls out to him. He says, you have a quick and speedy refuah shleima. He says, the Rav goes and says, I watched the car until it went out of sight. And then I went and I, and I started walking back towards my, towards my bedroom to go rest. Halfway there, he goes and he says, 
I realize I'm walking on both my feet and I don't have any pain. And I'm like, what? And I, I put weight on it and I put weight on this one. Like, you know, sometimes you forget which one is hurting you. You know, like, you know, like a kid gets a boo-boo and then they're like, oh, you know, it hurts. I need a lolly, I need a little candy, I need all these things. And then like five minutes later, yeah, it still hurts. And it's all of a sudden it's the other side. And he's like, wait a minute, which, and he goes back and, and he's like, he's like, the pain is gone. The pain was literally gone. And he sits and he, at this point, he's standing in his living room. The pain is gone and he starts dancing. He starts dancing in the middle of his living room by himself, no music just dancing around, thanking Hashem. It is to this scene that his wife opens the door and walks in to see her husband, who was not that long ago, sick and agonizing pain in bed, now dancing in the middle of the living room. And she's like, what's, what, what you doing? <laughs> what's going on? Like, what are you, what's, you know, like, uh, yeah, what's going on? And he goes and he says, the pain is gone. And he goes and he says, you know, Rabbi Chaim came, gave a bracha, like, you know, multiple brachas. And by the time he left, the pain was gone. And so she's like, that's amazing. He says, but why are you dancing? <laughs> you know, like, I understand, like, what's with the dancing? And the rabbi goes and says, you know, I wasn't able to dance on Simchas Torah with the, with, you know, for the, with the Torah. So now I'm dancing to make up for it. And at this point, you know, the wife was extremely appreciative. And the wife goes and says, you know, you should call Rabbi Chaim and let him know what happened. So he goes and he calls the driver, Rav Epstein, and he says, you have to tell Rav Chaim this. He says, immediately after Rav Chaim Kanievsky left my apartment, drove away, he says the pain subsided, that there was no more pain there. <coughs> so this Rav Epstein goes over and tells Rav Chaim, and he says, look what happened. He says, the Rav came, gave a bracha, and the pain went away. So Rav Chaim says, nah, you know, like dismissed it, you know, in his humility. He's like, there's a Gemara Megillah, page 15a, that says that even a simple person's blessing can be effective. This is what Rav Chaim Kanevsky says. Later, a short while later, this sick Rav, the, the Rav who was, you know, with the agonizing pain, went to visit Rav Chaim and, and thank him in person. And again, you know, Rav, he goes and says, you know, because the Rav came and then, you know, came and gave me a bracha. And then all of a sudden, all went away. And Rav Chaim goes and dismissed it. He's like, what, are you trying to make another story about me? He's like, what, you're going to make another, you know, maisa about me? And he says, it's simple. There's a Gemara in Avayda Zara, page 55a. And he goes and says, the Gemara goes and says <coughs> that HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes. And when HaKadosh Baruch Hu inflicts a illness, a suffering, a pain upon a person, he makes it swear, the pain, so to speak, that it will begin to afflict the person at a specific time and it would leave either at a specific time or through the efforts of a specific doctor, you know, or through a specific medication. So, and in the Rechaim Bozen, the Gemara says that even if the sufferer is an, is, is an, uh, worships his idols, Avodah Zara, he says if the illness was supposed to leave at that time, the illness would leave it and the guy might think, oh, it was because of X, Y, and Z, it really, it was a time that was meant for that illness to leave. So he says, I happened to get in the right time, right before the illness was supposed to leave. And that's why, you know, this person is no longer, is no longer sick. Not that I had, you know, if Chaim is humility, it's like not that I had anything to do with it. So the following Monday, <coughs> He, the, the Rav returned to Professor Dekel for a follow-up, a follow-up appointment. And the Rav just walks in. Before he was hopping and in pain and wheelchair and all that. Now he's just like walking in. And the professor's like, he's like, he's like, Rabbi Einfeld, is that is this you? And he's like, he's like, listen, I don't have a twin. He says, Yeah, this is me. He's like, what he's like, how is this how are you walking? So he says, uh, you know. <clears throat> A great healer came to visit me and uh, cured me and completely healed me. And he says, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He says, I had the Rav Argoyen, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, came to visit me, gave me a blessing, and it healed me. Now, <clears throat> the professor, you know, did a, you know, thorough examination. And he goes on, he says, and the professor goes and says, had I not seen this with my own eyes, I would have never believed that God performed a miracle. Like, this is an open miracle straight out. I cannot, I cannot begin to understand it. And then he said jokingly, he says, can I send to the rabbi some of my patients that maybe he could, uh, you know, go and heal. However, the, the doctor goes and says, even though it's gone now, this issue can return at any moment without warning. You have to be very careful to avoid any exertion on this. So the rabbi goes and says, listen, my son is getting married in a few weeks. He says, can I dance with my son at the wedding? So the doctor goes and says, that, absolutely not. He says, that type of strain is going to bring you all your pains back. 
So he says, oh, okay, okay, fine. You know, thank you very much. And he, you know, a, a short while later, he goes back to Rav Chaim, Rav Chaim Kanevsky. And when he goes to invite Rav Chaim Kanevsky to the wedding, he says, you know, by the way, I went to the doctor, the professor, and he told me that um, I can't uh, dance at my son's, you know, wedding. And by the way, this is only a gadol could say what I'm going to say the following. And Rav Chaim goes and says, what? He says, chas He says, the pains will not return. He says, not only that, I will dance with you at the wedding. And indeed, Rav Chaim came to the wedding and he danced together with this, with this other Rav. And the Rav who's saying over the story says, to the date of whenever he said the story, he has not suffered a reoccurrence of this pain. And I might add that this type of pain has been happening many times in his life. <clears throat> the lessons that you could take out from this story, number one is the humility of Rav Chaim Kanevsky. You know, like the, the true humility, like you know how sometimes, you know, like someone tells you something and you're like, nah, it has nothing to do with me. You know, you act all humble, but really inside you're like, come on, you know, like I literally said like six and a half chapters on Tehillim, you know, for you. I stopped speaking Lush and Hara for an hour a day so that, you know, this could happen. Like I've done 40 days of saying a Ziyashir or something and, you know, I've baked challah once a week, you know, like. I know what, <laughs> no, it wasn't for me, but between me and God, yeah, we know. <laughs> we know why, who else needs a bracha? You know, like, you know, just line up over here, you know, I'll have my, you know, open house when people can come to see me from 9 to 10, and, you know, like, there's humility, but then there's a different level of humility. The different level of humility is where you have with Chaim Kanievsky go, and not only did he say, nah, it wasn't me, he brought a proof that it wasn't him from a Gemara. He was like, no, 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 there's the Gemara over here, you know, the Gemara Nabai Nazar, you know, page 55a. Oh, no, 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 it's not that, it's a, you know, it's a different, you go and he would bring different sources to even prove that it's nothing to do. This is the true humility, the true anivas that we can only begin to try to work on. <clears throat> but another lesson that we can learn from this story is, look at, you know, the chesed, that a gadol who is, so, so, so busy. Oh, so busy. <laughs> no time at all. Like, if you think you're busy, like, forget about it. Like, no time. And he had time to go and visit somebody, you know, like, to go and take a minute. And, and maybe what you can't visit somebody. Someone's sick. Someone's, you know, family member passed away. Pick up a phone. Call them. You know, wish that, like, you know, get something. Like, you know, such a lesson. Like, no matter how busy we are, it, it, it doesn't hurt for you to go and pick up the phone. Like there were times where, let's say there was a shiva call, and I couldn't make it, so I called over the phone, and it was a type of thing that I wouldn't, you know, like, sometimes you're like, okay, I'll go to the simcha, they won't even know I'm there, I'll go to the you know, shiva call, they won't even know I'm there. Like, it was one of those situations, and I was so shocked, the, the person on the other end was so appreciative, he's like, I, you know, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you calling and you, whatever it was, you coming. And, you know, like, many times we think, like, eh, the person's not going to care if I come visit them. The person's not going to care if I come and send them a text message, oh, how are you feeling? The person's not going to care if I send them a mazel tov. No, you don't know. You never know. You never know where that person would be like, wow, that is so, I, I'm so appreciative of that. The chesed that we have to go, that no matter how much, you know, difficulty we have in our day-to-day -day schedule, if we could just put a little bit of time aside to do that little extra chesed. You know, Rav Chaim Yisad Avin Basikin in the, you know, his Vesikin minion in, in, in the shul nearby, the Letterman shul, and the, at one point there were two uh, mourners that wanted to daven in front of the Ahmad to lead the prayers. And one was the name of Avram and the other one name was David. <coughs> but the problem was is that they both needed to daven that day. So they went over to Rav Chaim and says, who's going to daven? So Rav Chaim goes and he says he's going to do a gyro. A, a gyro is like a lottery. He says we're going to do a lottery. And he says what we're going to do is, he says that he's going to open up his sitter, and the fir if the first letter on the page is an aleph, then Avram, which starts with an aleph, will lead the prayers. If the first letter is a dalit, that's for David, and then David will go and receive, uh, you know, and he will be the one to go and to, um, to lead the prayers. And this, this, this type of method, it, this is based off the famous, uh, something that's called the Gairil Hagra. The, uh, the Gra, the Vilna Goen, <clears throat> had this, this uh, Kabbalistic type of gyro that you were able to get certain answers for, for, you know, for, I guess, for certain questions. This, the particulars of how this girl works was um, this Rab Arya Levine. Rab Arya Levine was Rebetz and Kanievsky. So Rab Chaim Kanievsky's wife's grandfather was Rab Arya Levine. He received it from his grandfather, Rab Chaim Berlin. 
which is named after the yeshiva in, uh, um, you know, in, in Flappish, Chaim Berlin. The, <coughs> the, the, the Garol, there was a specific formula that you have to search within Tanakh and you turn a certain amount of pages, you know, so on and so forth. Not only that, it's very interesting, Rabbi Arya Levine actually had a Tanakh that was printed with like dual columns. And this he received from his grandfather, who is said to be that this is the very same Tanakh that the Gura used to perform the Gairo with. This is the actual Tanakh that the, the, the Vilna Gaon used to, to, uh, to do the Gairo with. And it's interesting, on this, on this uh, Gairo, uh, his, Rav Chaim Kanevsky's grandson, Rav Gedalia Honensberg, he said that there was a certain um, yeshiva that, you know, had uh, a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of stolen items, let's just call it like that. Things that just turned out missing. There was a thief on the loose. So the, the students, they came over to Rav Chaim and they asked, he says, can we perform the Gaira Lagra to identify the thief? And by the way, the girl, the, this girl was used in, in very interesting different cases to identify certain bodies of certain soldiers and things like that, but we're not going to get into, um, it, you know, into all the specifics on it now. But, but he goes and they asked Rav Chaim, can we, can we do this for the, to find out who the thief is? Thief is? So they were basically asking Rav Chaim Genesis, can we do this gyro? So um, I don't know if they were trying to figure out like how he did it and what was the formula. I, I don't know the, the details behind it, but Rav Chaim answered, he says that not everyone is worthy of receiving a heavenly response in this matter. This is like a type of thing like, you know, don't try this at home. There, there's, it exists, but you know, chances are we're not on the level to go and to, to do this. However, he gave them a bracha that should be able to find this um, you know this uh, uh, this this thief. The you know it's interesting when you're <coughs> there. There was a there was another story, and, and in fact, the uh, Rav Chaim in general opposes to use. He doesn't like using the goral. The, these these uh, goral, except when it's absolutely necessary. <coughs> there was once a boy and a girl that were dating, and they the girl had some sort of health issue. And they told the boy's family this, by the way, up front, this is the health issue, and they knew about it. And they were about to get engaged, and the family again were like, by the way, this is the issue, you know, I just want to make sure that you are aware of the issue. They were like, <clears throat> yeah, but I'm saying like, what, what, you know, what, how are we supposed to check it out? So they said, listen, he says, if you don't want to, you know, if you're not sure to check it out, let's go to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and whatever he says, that's what we'll do. And they both, they both agreed. So they go over to Rav Chaim. And they say this is, you know, this is the situation. You know, the girl has a has a medical problem, and the, they're about to get engaged. You know, should they continue with the engagement or not? So if Chaim Kanievsky goes and says this is a hard question, he says I cannot give a psak on this, but bring me a chumash. And they bring him a chumash, and he takes the chumash, and he goes over to the two fathers that were standing with him, and he goes and he says, <coughs> I'm going to open the chumash. Whatever the girl that he did beforehand, he says, I'm going to open the chumash. He says, by the page that I land on, if the first letter is a chaf, then it's Cain, because Cain is yes in Hebrew, it starts with a chaf. If the first letter is lamed, then it's no. Meaning that Rav Chaim Kenevsky goes over to these two men and he says, I'm going to open up a chumash at random. And there's going to be only two possible options. Either there's going to be a lamed, or a chaf. It's not like one of those things like, okay, you know, let's try it. Okay, let's, best out of three, you know? Okay, and let's try it, best out of seven. You know, like, <laughs> we couldn't find it yet, you know, like, until you figure out. Reb Chaim Kanievsky was like, listen, there is going to be either a chaf or a lamed. Those are the only two options. By the way, open a chamesh, see what percentage of times you get a chaf or a lamed. See how many times it text takes you to get a chaf or a lamed. <clears throat> so he takes a chamesh. He opens it up, it's a chaf. He looks at them and he says, Mazel tov. And they ended up getting married. And they, uh, you know, at this point in time, they're Baruch Hashem, happily married, and they have a child. I, you know, this story was told to me personally by, the, by one of the fathers that, that were by the, by the, what's it called? By Rav Chaim Kanevsky. But like, when he was telling me the story, he was like, do you understand? He says, Rav Chaim was certain that there's either going to be a chaf or a lamed. That's it. There was no other alternative that there will happen. Like this is, you know, like somebody on this level can do the garla, you know, any of these garlas, the garla gra. But for us, it's not. But, but look how he was connected to the spiritual. This is somebody in our generation. This is, it's crazy. <clears throat> to speak about the heavenly responses, there was a famous story that went out 
uh, right after, uh, well, it was also before, but, but even more so after Reb Chaim passed away. In fact, this was set over by his brother-in-law, Reb Yitzhak Zilberstein, in his Leviah. It set over this story. Whoever, I don't know whoever watched the, you know, the Leviah or, or listened to the Leviah, or was actually present by the Leviah. He says that, um, and by the way, this story, <coughs> I'll just tell you what the, the idea, this is the story of the grasshopper. And I'm sure if anybody's learned, you know, that any re this story was like viral at, all over the place. And I saw a bunch of different versions of this story. <clears throat> so I'm going to share with you the version that I actually saw written. This was before Reb Chaim was nifter. This was written. So Art School came out with Reb Chaim Kineski on the Chumash. So Reb Chaim Kineski on the Chumash in Parshas, in, in Sefer Vayikra, in Parshas Shmini, the 11th chapter, the 22 Pasuk, there speaks about, you know, grasshoppers. There is... It says over here, there, the story of what I'm about to share with you, the story that went viral right after Reb Chaim Kanievsky was nifter. To make matters more interesting, Parshas, when Reb Chaim Kanievsky was nifter on a Friday, he was, the Levaya was on a Sunday. That Sunday, what was the Parsha? That what was the Parsha of that week? The Parsha was Shmini. Meaning the, the, the story that went viral was written in the Parsha that he was Nifter in on the story of the grasshopper. So let me share you the story of the grasshopper if you haven't heard about this yet. So Rav Chaim Kanievsky was working on a Sefer about the signs of kosher locusts, the kosher grasshoppers. And they knew that there was like a story going around, this is while he was alive, about this grasshopper. So they went, one of his grandchildren went over to Rav Chaim and he says, you know, you know, Saba, you know, Grandpa Zaidi, what's the story with the grasshopper? And Rav Chaim Kanevsky says, eh, he also dismissed it. He said, what, you want to remember every single story that happened a hundred years ago? Eh, you push away. But the Rebbitz and his wife, you know, heard them asking. He says, I'll tell you what happened. So he says, Reb Chaim Kanievsky, she goes, was working on a very unique safer, discussing in detail the complex signs that Chazal said that one can identify the kosher species of a locust of a grasshopper. And he was, there was a certain technical details that was unclear to him. So Reb Kanievsky said, I went, I asked our neighbor, Reb Reichman, who was a science teacher, if she could get me a book about grasshoppers and maybe he would be able to go and get more information. So they got the book. However, it was still unclear on what Reb Chaim, Reb Chaim needed clarity on certain things. And that Shabbos, says Reb, the Reb goes and says, in the middle of our Shabbos Uda, a grasshopper, a locust, just suddenly flew in through the window and landed on our table in front of Reb Chaim Kanevsky. And Rav Chaim starts staring at the, at the locust, starts looking at it from all different angles, from all, you know, from back and forth. <clears throat> and then when Rav Chaim finished studying this locust, this locust went and jumped out the window. And the Rebbeson goes and says, you know, just so that you understand, he says, we don't live in a locust infested environment. He says, never once had before had a grasshopper, a locust jumped into the table, jumped in through the window and landed on the table. And Reb Chaim Kineski says, okay, now I understand what I was looking for. And he was able to finish the safer over there. And the Rebbeson goes and says, you know, there is a, you know, the, <laughs> there's a, a second part to the story. A short, uh, you know, sometime later, he says there was a young man that came to Reb Chaim and he asked him for mechila, for forgiveness. He says, well, you know, what was going on? He says, a, he was in yeshiva, and the magachir was going, and give, the, the, the rabbi giving the lecture was going, and giving over um, the information about grasshoppers, they were learning about grasshoppers, and then they said a story about Rechaim Kanievsky, he was sitting and learning, and he needed a certain idea of that, so God sent him a locust to his table, he was able to get all the answers that he needed, and then it flew out. Now this boy, you know, he was like, you know how they say stories of, you know, rabbis, it's exaggeration, or maybe it was made up, yeah, come on, really, a grasshopper, just when he was looking for something, a grasshopper came, come on, you know, do me a favor, it's all made up, and this is what he, this is what he, you know, the, the, the boy says over, he says, you know, that's what I said, he says, I went after the year to my dorm, to my room, and my dorm was infested with locusts, all over, grasshoppers all over, no other rooms in the entire house were affected except for my room. And I was like, you know, like, all right, you know, like, there's a certain time where you're like, it's not coincidence. This is not a random occurrence. And he says, you know, I, I ran over to the Rav and I want to ask for Mechila for doubting what happened. So Rav Chaim Kenev says, nah, there's nothing for you to even feel sorry about. There's, return home, you know, there's no issue. You know, Michael, he, he was Michael, he forgave him. It says, when the man returned home, the locusts had disappeared as if they've never been there before. And it's interesting, many years later, after the Rebbitzin passed away, there was a, a renovations that were happening in Rav Chaim's apartment so that the children would be able to take care of him easier. And Rav Chaim, you know, was learning through all these renovations, through all the construction, 
and all of a sudden the workman wanted to break down a certain section of the wall. And Rav Chaim went and stopped and intervened and said, no, 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 don't break down this wall. And they're like, well, you know, we need to, and he says, no, he says, this is where the locust jumped in. He says, I want to always remember this wall. Please leave this wall, you leave this wall alone. Wall alone. So this is the story that's written down. There is a second, there's an, a third part to the story, which I haven't seen written down. And that's why I'm saying, I don't know if it's true, I don't know if not, but I'm going to share with you because it's just like a, you know, a part of it. The first two, part, the first two parts that I just told you right now, that's written in the, in the book on Rav Chaim Kanevsky and the Chavish. But <clears throat> the third part is very interesting. So there was a, there was a professor, a specialist, um, who came to Rav Chaim Kanevsky, who read his Sefer. He was a specialist in grasshoppers. I don't know, you know in what particular, or, or insects, whatever it was. He was a specialist and he says, you know, Rav Chaim Kanevsky was talking about a rear grasshopper and the conclusion that Rav Chaim Kinesi came in is incorrect, this, this, uh, um, this professor of insects, whatever, came and said. And they were discussing it back and forth. While they're discussing, this rear grasshopper comes between them. And Rav Chaim's like, well, let's look at it. You know? And they start looking at it, and it turns out that Rav Chaim Kinesi was right. And the professor was wrong. The second part of the story I haven't seen written down, but I, I've, I've been hearing it, heard it uh, you know, circulating. So, the, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about, you know, this story, because the story was going viral, and I was like, why did Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein, out of, you know how many stories, I mean, we're literally speaking over three hours on stories of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. We have so much ta- information on Rav Chaim Kanievsky. When Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein, his brother-in-law, was saying over, why did he pick this story to say over in the funeral, as opposed to the, all the other stories? And I don't know his reasoning is behind it. I didn't have a chance, to, you know, to ask him. But in my mind, you know, like I was thinking about it, I'm like, this shows a manifestation of this shows a manifestation of God assisting in um, assisting in Rav Chaim Kanievsky in his learning. This is like where you know you have like the rabbi going and is going and doing miracles, right? We know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Tzadik Gaizer, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mekayim. We know that, that you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you know, listens to Tzadikim. However, this is something different. This is something where Rav Chaim was learning something and he needed clarity and God gave him a special siyata deshmaya, special heavenly help. And the lesson that I took away from this is that, you know, sometimes we're learning something and, and, or we're trying to accomplish something or, you know, we're, we're, we're struggling with something and all of a sudden HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes and sends us this type of Yeshua. Like, it usually comes in a roundabout way. But the difference over here with Reb Chaim, this was Reb Chaim learning about something and you see the outright open manifestation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu going and assisting him in his learning. Like that's something that, that, that is such a powerful lesson that, you know, also a lesson for us that we should never give up. Like, yes, we're not on the level on Reb Chaim, but we see in our own life how HaKadosh Baruch Hu assists us and helps us and guides us. And, and all of a sudden, you know, in hindsight, we look back and we'll be like, you know what? I was in a really dark place over here. I was in a really difficult time over here. And all of a sudden, HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent this and this. And it, it's sort of like, you know, whether it was a, a good cheer to listen to, a rabbi to talk to, a mentor to talk to, a good roommate, a friend. Like, and all of a sudden, it made me feel better. It made me, like, we see the salvation that happens in our own life. And we have to take that and realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu goes and, and is looking out for each and every single one of us. You know, there was, a, um, there was a young man from a traditional family that he went and uh, he was um, becoming more observant. And the problem was, is that his name was Nimrod. Let me repeat that. His name was Nimrod. Nimrod, the translation of Nimrod means we will rebel. Right? That's not a good name to name your child. Um, and not only that, it's named after there was a wicked king who wanted to go and burn Avram Avinu alive. That was Nimrod. Like, Nimrod was not a good character. But what you have is, and you have the lefty, you know, you know people in Israel who want to try to stray as much, you know, sort of as go against, you know, the Torah, they call, you know, like, exactly, it's like naming your son Paro, or like, why would you name your son Hitler? Like, you know, like, 
It's like the you know why? Why would you? It's, it's obviously you want to send the message out there. So he was because this Nimrod was becoming more observant. So he was like you know. How am I going to go around with the name of Nimrod? <laughs> I'm a, a from Jew. Like, what's your name? Shadach the for what? For Nimrod? Uh, for, uh, come again? Like, what? Nimrod ben what? Ben Hitler? Like, what's, what, what's, what's going on over here? And uh, so he goes over to Rav Chaim and says, Maybe I need to change my name. My name is Nimrod. And Rav Chaim looks at him and he says, Nimrod? He's like, he's like Your name is not Nimrod. Your name is Shaltiel. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a Pasuk in Haggai, the first chapter of the first. In the first chapter, there's a name, Shaltiel. He says, that's your name, Shaltiel. He says, what are you talking about, Nimrod? And he's like, he's like, well, you know, like, no, my name is, my name is Nimrod. You know, like, that's, you know, like, you know, and Rav Chaim is like, your name is Shaltiel. So he goes home to his mother, and he's like, he goes over to his mother, and he's like, listen, he's like, Ma, I don't know what to tell you. He says, I went to the rabbi. Apparently, my name now, from now on, is no more Nimrod. I'm now going to be referred to as Shaltiel. The mother looks at it, turns white, her jaw drops, and she's like, where, where did you get that name? Who told, what said that name? Who told you for name of that? You know, like, what? And she's like, solely composed herself, and she's like, she's like, when you were eight days old, you had a bris. And at your bris, we named you Shaltiel. But a short while later, a very short while later, we were like, what did we name him that? Shaltiel is such an old-fashioned name. We decided to call you by a more modern name. We called you Nimrod. He says, but nobody knows. Who told you? And he starts out, he says, Rav Chaim Kineski. Just like, Rav Chaim Kineski goes in. This boy says, hi, my name is Nimrod. He's like, no, that's not. Like, what? You know, like, you try this anywhere else, you're starting a fight, right? <laughs> like, no, I know my name. You know, this is my bad. He's like, no, your name is Shaltiel. Like, the Reb Chaim was connected to, like, some, like, there, I can't even begin to explain this. Like, like, where do you begin to explain such a, you know, such a, like, last class we spoke about, okay, someone did a certain sin, so there was a certain animal, a point to the Arizal, a Kabbalah, that there are different, different, there's different pictures that come on a person's forehead when a person does a certain sin, you know, like, his name, Reb Chaim knew his, you know, like, it, it's, it's something, you know, so what we associated with, with a lot, we associated with the, the Rav Chaim is godless was in his learning, non-stop learning Torah. And again, I can't say this was the reason because only God, only Hakadosh Baruch Hu knows. But we know one of the main, you know, one of the, one of the many amazing character traits of Rav Chaim was his non-stop learning of of you know of the Torah. Not only that, like his memory, like he reviewed it, he remembered all of it. T -t 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 Listen to this crazy story. There was a, a, a certain Tamil Chacham that went and he was writing this, this uh, safer on the, uh, you know, on the Mar He was sort of putting a new edition on the Gur Arya, which is a work on Rashi uh, by the Maharal. And he came across in Parshas Vayechi that the Maharal writes, that ha the Chazal brings down, that B'tchiyas HaMesim, when the dead will be resurrected after Mashiach comes, they will be transported to Ma'aras HaMachpelah, to where, you know, in, in Hebron, I don't know, with Maris Machpela, I'm trying to remember the English translation, double cave, whatever it was, in Hebron, and there they will rise from there. So the Maharal, however, doesn't cite the source of where this Chazal is located. And at this point in time, when he was, you know, producing this, this you know, new version of the Gur Arye, he goes over and, and he starts searching for this Chazal, but he couldn't find this Chazal. And at this point in time, there was no search engines where, you know, there was like a Oitzar al you're able to search in, and then, you know, everything pops up to you on the computer. The only search engines that were available back then were human search engines, people that learned a lot and were, you know, were, were, were able to remember all the sources. So he goes, everybody that he knows, every human search engine that he knows, he went and he asked all the Tamid Chacham, do you know where this source is? And everyone's like, no, we never heard about it. Finally, he goes in desperation, one of his friends goes and says, listen, there's a guy in Kiryas Arba, and this guy's life work is to collect information about Hebron and Ma'aras HaMachpela. And he says he collected all rabbinic literature and put it into one sort. This is part of the rabbinic literature. You know, like, this is part of the literature that you're looking for about Maris HaMachpelah, Tchiyas HaMesim. Go to him. If somebody knows where it is, he knows where it is. So he goes and, you know, finally getting in touch with this person, which was difficult as it is. He says, listen, he says, I'm writing this, you know, I'm, I'm putting a new version out of the Sefer. He says, this is what the Chazal says, that Tchiyas HaMesim, all the dead are going to go into the Maris HaMachpelah. And from there, they're going to go and they're going to rise from the dead. Do you know the source? And he says, you know, this doesn't sound familiar to me, but let me review my notes and let me get back to you. A week later, 
this man calls back the author and he says, listen, I checked through all my notes and I can't find a source for you know, Maral's statement. He says there are only two possibilities. Either the Maral had access to a source that is no longer available to us or the, he was interpreting a Chazal differently than it appears to us. So the author didn't have any other option, but you know, when he was writing the Sefer, he wrote source unknown. Couldn't, couldn't source it. A short while later, he was walking in Bnei Brak, near Rehov Rashbam, which is where Reb Chaim Kanevsky used to live, and he saw that Reb Chaim Kanevsky was walking alone. And he decided, let me take the opportunity, let me ask him, maybe he knows where it is. And he ran over to Reb Chaim Kanevsky, and Reb Chaim Kanevsky listened over to his question, and then he began to, you know, talk to, you know, very, very low Reb Chaim. So the author went and he bent over to try to listen to see what Reb Chaim was saying. And Reb Chaim was saying the following. He's like, Bavli? No. Yerushalmi? No. Mechilta? No. Sifra? No. Sifri? No. Pausing by a minute. The Medrash Agada? No. He was going through this within seconds. He was saying, Bavli, stopping, say no. Then he goes, Zohar, and at this point he stops. Rav Chaim turns to the author, and he says, look at the Zohar in such and such a place, maybe it's there. The author thanked him, ran over to the nearest shul, the nearest base of opened up the Zohar, and opened up the location where Rav Chaim says, and lo and behold, it's exactly the source was where, where he found it. But, like, can you imagine, and this is the author, was going, he says, Rav Chaim Kineski was reviewing literally the entire body of Chazal in like 90 seconds. He was bobbly. No. The, like, sort of like, uh, like his computer, he went through the entire, you know, the entire oral law. He went through until he went, until he found it. How, you know, you think about it, you want to go and you want to search it. <coughs> It'll take you, yeah, a few hours if you're a genius and you have all this farm in front of you. Or a few days, maybe not. If you have a computer, it would still take you. Rav Chaim did it in a mere, like, under two minutes. He went through everything and he found the exact source. Like, do we understand, like, just to get you the understanding of it, so you're listening to a class right now. And th these type of classes, I'll just put it out there, it's a very easy listen, right? There's not a lot of thinking that you have to do. It's stories and lessons. It's very easy, very comfortable, very relaxing. And might I say, maybe not from mine, but other class, people's classes are enjoyable. You hear stories and things like that. Maybe I speak too fast. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe tomorrow, yesterday. What am I saying? Words, English, Torah. Okay, so now, when you, when you think about it, you're like, so you just listen to an easy class. You finish a class. We're, I don't know, blank percent done. I don't want to give up so, <laughs> how much of we're done of this class. If you stop for a second right now, how much of the class do you remember? How much do you actually remember from, you know, what was spoken? Again, it was an easy class. It was not a hard class. It was a story here. How many stories do you remember? How many things like that? And stories are very easy to remember. Do you understand, like, we go and we sit and we learn for an hour. We come out of that learning session, let's call it. What do we take away? How much do we, do we remember from that? Do you know what it takes that you're able to go and review everything and know exactly where it was located? And I'll tell you one up. Imagine somebody goes and asks you, I, I put out a few sources, oh, the Gemara Megillah, a, a, a few Gemaras, and maybe a very few sources that I, that I mentioned today. And if somebody would go and ask you, oh, where is this source or whatever it is? And we spoke about it right now, and you were listening, you were paying attention, assuming that you're not on the phone playing Angry Birds or whatever it is that people are playing nowadays. Imagine that you were listening and you were playing and you were, you know, not listening, playing. You were listening, you were focused. Do you remember the source that we just said, like a mere, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago? Maybe yes, maybe not. But if you would want to go in as a takeaway, then when you listen to something, that you're able to remember it. You're able to go and be like, yes, I just heard it and it's here and, and there. You know, like it's this and this source. Like, how are you supposed to, how, how are we supposed to do that? And I want to tell you one that before I started speaking, um, I remember <clears throat> that I was going to a, a certain, um, I used to visit Farakwe, I used to visit my wife's aunt and uncle every once in a while, and I used to daven with Rabbi Eitan Feiner, and in his shul, the white shul. And Rabbi Eitan Feiner, whoever hasn't heard his shirim, you know, if you think I speak fast, oh, whoo, 
ooh, you're in for a surprise. Rabbi Eitan Feiner, it, like a genius, like rumbling sources. And I used to, I, I loved his, you know, the, listening to the classes. And sometimes, even before I started speaking, I liked, if I, if I heard something that I liked, I wanted to write it down. But it was Shabbos, so I couldn't write it down. So he would say something, let's say he would speak in the morning, right, you know, between, right before Musaf, he would say something and I found it right, and I wanted to remember it, so the entire day I was reviewing it. And I was reviewing it by Moses Shabbos, I was able to write up, I would say close to 90%, I was able to, to, you know, to get to, you know, almost everything that he was, uh, that he was saying. But how did, I, how did I remember that 90%? I was reviewing it constantly in my mind, and then I was able to go. So if you want to go and you want to take away, how many times are we sitting in our day, day-to-day life, and most of the time our brain is just on space-out mode? You know, you're like, just like, what just happened? Like, how am I here? I'm in shul, I'm davening, I forgot about this. You know, like, oh my gosh, I just finished Safer to Hell and I don't remember starting it. You know, somehow I redid my wardrobe, fixed this, I flew to Paris, I came back. You say, Tfilas Aderach after you daven, right? Because we're all traveling all over the world. You want to go and you want to remember something, you have to do a little bit of review. So, one lesson that we take away, you want to, Rav Chaim Kinesu was constantly in mind in learning Torah. So you're listening to a shir, you're opening up a safer, you're learning something. Maybe you won't be able to remember everything, but try to tap into at least one aspect that you learned. One idea and review that, that you know that idea. It might be a story. Review that story, that you know that story. Every story has a lesson, and every lesson doesn't have to be by the, by the speaker. You can have your own lesson from the story. So you take something away from everything that you encounter on. How many times in our day I don't know how many people do this, but before you go to sleep, you do like a cheshman and nafesh, you think about your day. And how many times you're like, wait a minute, like, I was up for like 14 hours, 16 hours. I only remember like 20 minutes. Like, I mean, I know I worked for some part of that. I'm pretty sure I drove, you know, like, where is our, you know, like, we could utilize our brain so much more, so much more. And again, it's hard to like jump to utilize your brain to the maximum, but at least when you're learning, when you're focusing, when you're davening, when you're doing something, take, take one lesson, one idea, one idea that you can review after you finish it. This way you take something, you put it in your pocket, you listen to a Torah class, you listen to, you, you know, you learn something, you da- even da- by the way, even davening, even davening, you say something, you da- we daven for sick people, and you know, you may have a list, you may not, you daven, but you say the words and you leave, but when you leave, do you st- does that still affect you? Like maybe the next time you daven for somebody, you say the Tehillim, you say Rafaini, you say the name, but then you leave that and be like, you know what, have that in your mind, just three seconds, just like review what just happened. That keeps things fresh in your mind, that, gives your, that, that also brings your memory to a much higher level. And I have to say, like this, if you want to encounter, if you want to get a better memory, I strongly recommend to review things in your mind. I remember when I was in Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, and I had uh, um, one of the things that Baruch Hashem was able to do is to do Gemara by heart, the Gemara Baal Peh, the Shagatai Gemara Baal Peh. The first, da- the first blot that I did was, it took me hours. But as I continued doing the Gemara by heart, it became easier because I, my brain was getting used to it and it was something that I was, and then when, when you start learning and you utilize that aspect, what's the aspect? That you're just reviewing it in your mind. You're remembering it again and again. If, if, if you, if something's important to you, you remember it. If so, so you make it important. You take something away and you put it in your pocket. No matter what class you go to, you're able to learn something from anything. Any sure Torah that you listen to, you can take away and change your life. Guaranteed. I used to do this in my guys' class that before we left, we used to go around. I did this, I don't know why I didn't do this more often, but I did this for a short period of time. Before I left, I said, okay, what, what is everybody going to take away? There's a takeaway. Like everybody go around and we, everybody goes and says one thing that they're going to go and take away from the, from the class. And, and by the way, you're a lot of copy. There's no, you know, you could say, you know, ditto to the guy before. Whatever it was, you're able, but, but all of a sudden when that mindset is there, now you begin to be like, okay, fine, now I'm, let me, you know, now I'm there, now let me think about it. Let me, what am I going to take away? Moving forward, you know, Rav Chaim Kanevsky, <clears throat> a little bit behind time. We're not doing another one. We're finishing, by the way. We're finishing this week. I get, we're not doing another one of this. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not stopping. Okay, so um, we can never finish, but from what I prepared, we're going to try to finish. So, the, you know, Rav Chaim Kanevsky, his, his mind was always in learning. He was always reviewing. He was always in, in this mindset that he would eat something, so he would see what's there. He would know what bracha rishonah to make, what bracha to make, because he sees the food. But by the time he finishes eating it, 
and he has to go in now and say the bracha chrona, the after blessing, he goes over to a sitting next to him, he's like, do me a favor, he says, what did I just eat? He says, I, you know, like, his mind was constantly only about learning, reviewing and learning and learning and learning and learning, so he, he didn't even realize what he ate. He, he saw it, but it didn't, because his mind was only focused on learning. You know, one time, there was an um, American Rashiva that was sharing a tender with Rechaim Kanievsky. And when they came back to Bnei Brak, the, um, they reached Rechov Rashbam, which is Rav Chaim's house, and Rav Chaim saw that all the people were like fumbling into the pockets, they were looking to pay the driver. So Rav Chaim goes and says, what are you, you know, goes over to the American Rosh Hashiva and says, what are you doing, what are you looking for? And the, the, the Rosh Hashiva goes to Rav Chaim Kanevsky and he says, I'm looking for Shkalim. So Rav Chaim says, oh, you're looking for Shkalim? There's no problem, wait one second, I have it in my house. So he runs into the house, and just for whatever understands, Shkalim is um, money, and it's like saying dollars in Israel. The currency in, in, in Israel is shkalim. So he runs into the house of Chaim, and he comes back, and he hands Rosh Hashiva a Mishnayis shkalim. There's a Mishnayis also that's called shkalim. And Rav Chaim was sitting in the thing, he's looking, he says, he, he says when somebody says, I'm looking for a shkalim, what's the first thing that comes into his mind? Oh, Mishnah is shkalim, right? Doesn't even enter his mind, money, like, what, what do you mean money? Like, he's like, yeah, you're looking for Mishnah, he says, and he gives him a Mishnah is shkalim. You know, I was contemplating about to say the story or not to say the story, I was going back and forth. When I read this story, I, it brought, it brought a, such a smile to my face. And, you know, I, so I decided that I am going to say over this, this short story that, because that, it says, I believe, I, I don't remember where I read it, but whatever it was that Rav, Rav Chaim went and later on him and his Rebbitzin would laugh when they would speak about this, uh, this story. But when Rav Chaim was the first date that he went on with his, with his Rebbitzin, with his column, he, um, he, he was there and there was a silence. You know, Rav Chaim Kanevsky was like nonstop learning in Torah. So, you know, after a you know, conference silence, he goes over to his, this girl that he's dating and says, so her father was, you know, a huge, you know, the Gadol Hadar. You know, Rebetzin Kanievsky's father was a huge, was the Gadol. And uh, he, he goes over and he says, it was, was, by the way, Rabbi Yashem. So he goes over and he says, so um, to break the silence, he's like, uh, so what's your father learning? He, he was waiting. He was like, okay, let me speak to learning to this girl that I'm dating with. Said, so what's his breaking of the ice? So what's your father learning? Like that was where he was. Like he was like, okay, let me speak to learning. He was so involved in like learning Torah that he went on the date and he's like, okay, so you know, let's let's speak about learning. And in hindsight, they they go on they and they laugh about it. But to show you the godless of somebody who's like nonstop learning, nonstop learning Torah, and to the point is. That, you know, you think, okay, no, not he was in a different world, which, granted, yes, but he was also very much in this world. Like, after the bar mitzvah, let's say his grandchildren, the family would go and look over the pictures of the, you know, of the bar mitzvah. And Reb Chaim would go and look at the pictures. And there was a picture over there of him. But Reb Chaim, how often, when does he look in a mirror? He goes and he says, he sees a picture of him and he says, oh, that's my neighbor, Rav Yitel Shapiro. There's a rabbi who looked similar, and in fact, my sister in Israel sent me a picture of this, and I wanted to share it, but it was a very small picture, and I couldn't share it. It, it was an older man with a white beard, and he's like, oh, he says, here, that's me. And his grandchildren's like, no, they, he's like, Saba, that, that's your neighbor. He didn't even know how it looked. In fact, to, to make the matters more interesting, Rav Chaim Kinesi once came to the to a house, and there was a mirror. And, and he, as he passed by, and he goes and he says, you know, who, who is that person? And the owner is like, that, that's, a, that's a mirror, that's you. <laughs> he's like, he's like that, you know, like, Rechaim Kanevsky was so in a different world, like, even like, mirror, like, this is where he, his mind was always on learning. And yes, maybe we're not on that level, but maybe for two minutes we could be on that level where we're like completely focused and learning, or even if maybe we're not there, there yet, where we can be completely focused after the class and take away and review it, then maybe while we're in the class for like two minutes, can you like, you know, focus without spacing out, without like, you know, you're about to dive in for two minutes, can you like just say all the words? Can you just concentrate for, for like one minute, 30 seconds? Like try to take that away and implement it into your own life of what we will do in, our, in like an extreme focused mindset. The more that you do it, the more, first of all, the more that you appreciate it. I can tell you how awesome it is when you're completely focused on learning that the whole world is like, 
like it's like you finish learning and you're like wait what where are you know like what's going on you know like when you're in that zone there is like uh, it's like it's like so awesome i you know i can't tell you and, I, and what i i wish that it would happen to me more more often than you know than it ha than it does but it's like oh it's like such a it's like well, you you're sitting and you're and you're learning and all of a sudden it's like wait what time is it like you know like you're completely lost at it be like how is it possible it was just like you know like whatever it was you know two minutes ago how how do we jump in like how do you get to that that aspect and by the way i'm speaking to myself also you have to zone in you have to like block out the entire world and by the way this is nice and this is great and this is really what we're speaking about is learning torah but the truth of the matter is you could utilize this in all aspects in your life you want to utilize it in school in college whatever it is that you're doing you're able to completely focus you're working you want to be completely in the zone you're able to to completely do that someone's talking to you, you want to be completely focused you're able to like really zone in and everything else becomes like oblivious the idea behind you know this concept is like you know you think Rav Chaim Kinevsky was a god lodar but the truth of the matter is really scary truth to be honest is that really anybody could be a god Rav Chaim Kinevsky had free will he had choices, just like me and you. Okay, granted, he grew up in the stipler's house. He grew up, his uncle was a chazanish, you know, like, all right. So, you know, he had maybe a head start with, the, you know, certain things. But, like, the bottom line is he was human, just like me and you. And he had choices, and he had tests, and he had free will, and he made his choices. You know, you look at Bibi Netanyahu, a genius of a man. He made his, he could have been a huge Tamba Chacham. Could have. Hopefully, maybe he will. Maybe he will, you know, do chuba or whatever. But whatever it is, you know what it would be if Einstein would have, you know, opened up a Gemara and learned? Like, we all have choices. Bibi made a choice. Einstein made a choice. Rav Chaim made a choice. Everybody who's listening to this, who's watching this, who's hearing this, you have a choice. And that choice is going to keep on coming. And what is going to be your choice? Are you going to choose to... Go to the right, go to the left. Are you going to choose to be successful, to fail? And maybe, maybe you'll only choose one successful thing test a day. But at least you chose one successful thing a day. Don't be one of, that, one of those people that are constantly failing on everything. Even if, the, even if what you take away is that you watch a little bit less YouTube, TV, movies, whatever. Even that is a success. Even that is an aspect that you, okay, fine, you succeeded in something. Maybe not fully, but at least you got somewhere. You know, you, you speak about these godless, of, of these amazing stories and amazing things in life, on, on, you know, Rav Chaim, and, or any godl. You know, Rav Chaim can actually bring down, there's, there's another angle that you can have tremendous power in this world. And it brings down the Archas Yosher. Rav Chaim quotes a sefer, the Sefer Hasidim that teaches that a person who guards his mouth from prohibitive speech and is always careful to use his gift, the divine gift of speech for proper things, will merit, will be zocha, that everything that he decrees will be fulfilled. And in fact, the chida goes and says that one who doesn't desecrate his word will merit that whatever comes out of his mouth will be done. There's a famous story with Abdur Rav regarding, you know, you know, we're not going to get into that, uh, regarding Gehenim and how many souls he was able to take out. I believe it was Abdur Rav. He was able to take out a lot of souls from Gehenim because of, one of the reasons he was able to take out so many was because of his power of speech. Like, the more careful you are with speech, the more powerful your speech has. The Chafetz Chaim was extremely careful uh, with monetary matters. And after each volume of his work was going out for print, he, he would go and he would check it to make sure there was no misprints. So the briar won't be cheated and getting a defective uh, safer. So his daughter was 12 or 13 years old, and her father asked her to check a few volumes of Mishnabura before he sells it. So he goes, she goes over to him and says, you know, Abba, I'm going to meet my friends now. Later, I'll be happy. I'll check a hundreds farm for you. When she returned home, she was surprised to see that the table was piled high with a hundred svarim of Mishnabura. And he goes over and he says, you said that you'll gladly check a hundred svarim. And the Chavetz Chaim goes and says, a Jew has to be careful not to make empty promises. Now you have to keep your word and check a hundred svarim. You said something, you got to do it. 
And in fact, a young man once came to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, and he says, I wanted to take off a day off from work, and I couldn't find an excuse. So he told his manager that his grandmother passed away. And of course, the manager gave him off. He has to go for the funeral, so on and so forth. Two days later, this man tells Rav Chaim, he says his grandmother, who was healthy, active, suddenly passed away. And he, has a, you know, he had a feeling that somehow he was responsible for her death by what he said. Now, he thought probably that Rav Chaim would console him and say, no, don't worry, everything. You know. So Rav Chaim goes over to him and he says, you acted very improperly. He says, you did a foolish thing. The Gemara tells us in Moed Cotton, page 18a, that a human speech has power. It's forbidden to say foolish things. He says, now you have to accept upon yourself to study Mishnahis every day for your grandmother's, uh, you know, until your grandmother's dead right for her soul. Like he didn't, he didn't consult. He says, no, he said, you, you, we don't realize the power of speech that we have. You know, there was a couple that um, they wanted to buy an apartment in Bnei Brak. And they had a growing family and they were looking for you know, a specific size on the you know, specific area and it wanted to be you know, like obviously a specific price. And they found something, right location, it had enough space, perfect price. And they were excited to go you know, forward with the, you know, with the sale. And as they're you know, coming to see the apartment for the second, third time, there was an elderly woman who just like appeared before, you know how like sometimes there's just like a person there and you don't know how they got there and they're just like there. So there's like, they, were, they were like looking at the house and all of a sudden there's like an, there's like an older woman that was just sitting there. And uh, she stops, she blocks the path in front of them and she goes over to them and she says, you will not buy this apartment. It isn't appropriate for you. And the woman goes on as if this is not a interesting scenario as it is. She goes, I know that there's a curse on this apartment and you don't want to deal with that. So like the husband's like, w w you know, like, how do you know that there is a curse on this apartment? So the woman says, it's very simple. She says, because I am the one who cursed it. And they're like, well, w what do you mean? Why would you curse the apartment? And you know, the woman goes and says, you see, the owner went and built an extension. And that interferes with my privacy. So therefore I cursed him and this apartment and I make sure, I'm going to make sure that no one buys this. So they were like, as much as you love a house, apartment, if some random old lady comes over to you and buys and says, hey, by the way, this is cursed, you're going to be like, one moment, you know, like, let me speak to the real estate agent. You know, like, it's going to make you, you know, question something. So they're like, what's the story with the, the curse? And the agent's like, excuse me? And we're like, yeah, the curse uh, on the apartment. You're like, okay, I don't know what you're talking about. And she, he goes and started explaining, you know, there's an old woman who called him said that there was some sort of curse on the apartment. He goes back to the seller, and the seller says, listen, he says, you know, this is an angry shrew of a woman, and um, she has no other thing to do other than to complain, but we wanted to build an extension. We went over to the Bezdin of Rav Nissim Karelitz, and he heard both sides, and he allowed us to extend our apartment. And he, says, and he says, if you want, go to Rav Nisim Karelitz and, and speak to him about it. They went over to the rabbi, and the rabbi says, yeah, I remember that case very well. He says, the owner had every right to build, and you shouldn't have to, you know, don't be worried at all about this curse. And they went, and they bought the apartment. A short while later, there was a bar mitzvah of the neighborhood, and they were invited. They figured, you know what, perfect, let us go, and this will meet all the neighbors, it will be very nice. So they go, and they, uh, they, they make their way to the, to, the, to the celebration, to the bar mitzvah event. And as they're you know, going in, their neighbor, this elderly woman, was there also. And she looks at them, and she starts screaming on the top of her lungs in front of everybody in this bar mitzvah, liars, cheats, crooks! You know, deceiving. He says, you and your husband are terrible people. You should never, nothing should ever work out for you in your entire lives. And she continued to scream at them in front of everybody. This woman's face turned from purple to white, to pink, to all the colors of the rainbow and back again. She has never been so insulted, so humiliated in her life. And she was about to open her mouth. She says, she's, she's done nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. And she's about to open her mouth. And all of a sudden, she felt someone tugging her very, very anxiously on her, on her sleeve. She turns around, and there was, a, there, was an, there was a woman over there. And she says, do me, please, a personal favor. Do not answer her. She's like, I've never seen this woman before. I just really met that woman before. Like, you know, like, 
but she decided she's going to hold herself back and she's not going to answer not going to answer this woman she stayed a few moments in you know in the bar mitzvah as long as it was as it wasn't obvious that she was running out to cry because of what this woman did and as soon as like everybody continued on with it she like, made a beeline right outside the door the woman that begged her to you know to keep quiet followed her and she says you know let me explain myself of why i asked you not to not to talk back he says you know my husband and i had been married for many many years in fact we married for 22 years and we were trying to have children we couldn't have any children and we went over to all the doctors and we went over to all the specialists and nothing doing we went over to all the capitalists all the school we tried everything and you know went to all the, the grave sites of all the rabbis nothing to it so that this you know at this point we went over to Rav Chaim Kanievsky we asked you know, for, for a blessing. And he asked us all these questions of all the various things that we've tried and we explained to him all the things that we tried. After a while, Rav Chaim went and told us and he said, you know, not everybody is decreed to have children. And, the, you know, the husband was like, you know, please, you know, Rabbi, is there nothing else we can do? So the, Rav Chaim goes and says, there's one more thing I can suggest. And this is based off of Gemara and Shabbos, page 88b. And it says that if somebody embarrasses somebody, and that person who's embarrassed refrains from, from responding, from paying back his embarrasser, see, or sir, sorry, then that person has a power to bless you. He says, maybe if you find somebody like that and get them to bless you, maybe that will work out. And this woman goes and says, it's been four years since the rabbi told us, and we haven't encountered anybody that went and was embarrassed in public. He says, now we see the opportunity, please bless me with a child. And at this point, this woman is already emotional, the, the woman that got embarrassed. So she starts blessing her with a child. She starts saying to Helen, and they both say to Helen, crying, you know, for that this woman should have a child. Less than a year later, these two women cried again. But they cried again on the bris of this woman who couldn't have children for over 22 years at her son's breast. That's when they cried. Many times in our life, many, many times in our life, we come across things that we can either look at as negative things in our lives, or we could look at as opportunities in our life. We could look at things that are maybe more of a negative, severely negative aspect, or we could look at things where like, okay, now I have an opportunity, I have, I have something that I'm able to go and accomplish. We don't realize the power of our speech. We don't realize the power of our blessings. Many times we come across the day where maybe we're upset, we're angry, we're, you know, somebody did something to us. At that point in time, we could look at it as God is punishing us. Or, and sometimes yes, maybe it is true, or we could look at it as like, okay, now I have an opportunity. If I, don't res if I respond correctly, now I have an opportunity in Ace Rutzen to go on Davin. If we look at our lives in this angle, we don't see the problems. We see opportunities. Your spouse is acting not nicely to you. Don't respond back, go and pray for something. Your boss is screaming at you, you messed up, you're tired, you're exhausted, you don't want... There's so many opportunities. Every time that we overcome ourselves in one way or another, we have an opportunity to go and ask Hashem for something. Granted, sometimes are more powerful than others, but this exists almost on a daily basis. By the way, I just want to put another uh, pointer out there that there's another that a, a big schooler uh, for having children. Rabbi Chaim would bring down was to 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 write and and publish your chidush Torah. If somebody who doesn't have any children, I just wanted to put it out there. But I want to finish off with one thought, and we'll finish off with this thought: that you know, we hear all these amazing stories about Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky, and most people will be like. Man, I wish I knew this beforehand. Like, how much I wish I could go and get a bracha from him. Had I known all these stories, I would have gotten a bracha. Who knows what I've been We have this desire. So, I want to share with you something I heard, and I believe I heard this from Rabbi Igal Cohen, an Israeli speaker. Uh, and he's, you know, he said this over a story about himself. Again, I may be botching it up, so please, but the, the point is, is solid. Uh, the point is, is accurate. The, the, the details might be a little bit botched because I heard it as sort of as a side passing. But basically, this rabbi had a hard time having children. And he was close with a certain rav by the name of Rav Moshe Levi. And this rav, after he was nifter, 
he found out, this rabbi who had a hard time having children, that this particular rabbi that he was close to had a very, very powerful, you know, blessing for people that if somebody needed children, they went to him and gave them a blessing. And he's like, I was so close to this rabbi. How did I not know this? I could have asked this rabbi for the blessings. So he was, he was upset until he realized, okay, hey, listen, the, the rabbi passed away. He says, but let me go to the caver. He goes over to the gravesite of this rabbi and he prayed, uh, you know, and he asked and he prayed and, you know, did something and a short while later, he had a child. He had a child. And he quotes a Gemara in Chulin, page 7b, that says, G'daylem tzaddikim b'misasan yoyser b'mechayein. Tzaddikim are greater after they pass away, greater than when they were alive. Reb Chaim Kanievsky passed away. We, we lost something so dear, so precious, so amazing in our, you know, in our world. But the power that he possessed for the blessings, for all these things, that has not gone. If you go and, let's say you can go to the cave, right? it's a Bnei Brak, you're not able to travel there, you're in America, wherever you are, you're able to do something, Le'ilu Nishmasin. You're able to say, okay, fine, listen, I'm, I'm learning now, Le'ilu Nishmas, Rav Chaim Kenevsky. I'm doing, I'm giving tzedakah, Le'ilu Nishmas, Rav Chaim Kenevsky. The, the, the power is still there. You're able to go and still tap into that. Don't think that, okay, fine, it's gone, I can't do anything. No, you could do something. Learn a little bit more. Give tzedakah, do something in merit of this righteous person. And in merit of that, may he go and daven in front of the Kisei HaKavod and provide you for whatever it is that you are uh, searching and you're looking for, which obviously it's really all coming from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, so really the correct bracha will be that may HaKadosh Baruch Hu God bless you with whatever it is that you're guiding, whatever it is that you're looking for, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu give it to you in the best way possible.